Okay, so while you're all still fresh, let's talk about the essays, yeah? So, uh, kind of broad outline stuff. I'm looking for something like five to 10 uh, citations. Uh, those citations can come from the course readings. Actually, it would give me a warm and fuzzy feeling inside if you cited some of the readings that I've assigned to you, suggesting to me that you've read them and got something out of them. That would be great. Furthermore, you can use arguments that I used in class. That's also fine. You can cite these lectures. So look up online how to cite lectures. Uh, I will know if you use an argument that came out of my mouth. I will remember the arguments that I made to you. So if you are using one of, my, one of the arguments presented in class, it's a really good idea to cite them. Uh, we're talking about 1,500 words or so, ends up around six pages, something like that. Plus or minus 10% is within the, within the range. Uh, if you give me something that's 500 words, that's very bad. If you give me something that's 4,000 words, I'm eventually just gonna give up and stop reading. So around that range, yeah. And the core thing that I'm looking for is a thesis. And that is a harder thing to do than it sounds like. So a thesis by a thesis, I mean something like a challenging idea that is yours that you're defending with an argument. Right, so it can't be something like memory is an important cognitive process because that's not a challenging thesis. That's not something that anybody would disagree with. So it's gotta be something at least sort of controversial, something which you need to make an argument for. Uh, a variety of thesis that I would recommend to you is the following, something like, here's some recent research on memory cog categorization or problem solving, uh, and here is an argument from this class that shows that either uh, the argument I presented to you in class is no longer relevant. So here's maybe I, so I offered you, for example, a bunch of critiques of prototype theory. One of the essay topics is on prototype theory. Here's a, here's a variety of thesis you could present. This argument was presented against prototype theory. Here's some recent research that deals with that argument, that makes that argument no longer applicable or no longer conclusive. That would be a great thesis. Here's another variety of the same sort. Uh, here's some research, recent research in prototype theory. Here's an argument from class that shows that it's still un that argument is still unaddressed in the recent research. So they haven't dealt with these things that we've been talking about. Right? So that shows me a couple of things. That shows me that you've read some novel research, you've been to class, you've been listening, and you can integrate those two things in a meaningful way. Okay? So uh, a paper without a thesis is a lit review, a liter literature review. So you're just saying what a whole bunch of other people have said. That's not not a paper, that's not a fail, uh, but it's not an A-plus paper. So if you're just telling me what other people have said, that's not gonna be a top mark, okay? Is that reasonably clear? Uh, and I would like it to be in APA format. I'll talk in a minute what I mean by that. Um, I'm gonna recommend the following structure for you. The abstract part is not recommended, that is required. So you're gonna start, the, the first thing that you're gonna have is an abstract of your paper. So you'll see a whole bunch of examples of abstracts when you're doing your research. Most scientific papers start with an abstract. The point of an abstract is to describe the content of your paper in the most informationally dense way possible. That's the goal of it. And the reason why you need to learn the skill of writing abstracts will be immediately clear to you when you're doing this research because you don't wanna have to read the whole paper to find out what it's about. You're gonna, you're gonna read a whole bunch of abstracts and the only information that you're gonna get from most of them is this isn't relevant to what I'm doing right now, right? This is, so the point of the abstract is to be like the opposite of a mystery novel. You want it to spoil the ending of your paper. I wanna know, I mean, ideally, I will know from your abstract what your paper is about, its topic, what the basic argument is going to be, and what you're gonna conclude. So I wanna know the ending right at the beginning. And that's gonna help me read your papers. So typically, like if, for, in a journal article, the point is to know whether you need to read the rest of the paper. Uh, this is at least partly a response to issues that we've been talking about in this class. Uh, the issue of 
the finitary predicament, right? So we're all in the finitary predicament. And you'll feel that particularly keenly when you're doing research because there is way too much research out there for you to read anything like all of it. There is no possibility that you'll be able to read all of the papers available on your topic. You have a very finite amount of time to do this in. And what the abstract does is help alleviate that problem. It helps you to tell whether you need to dig deeper or not. So for my, for, for my perspective, that abstract helps me know what your paper is about. And then I'm going to read the rest of it in the way that an editor reads a novel. So, you know, when you're writing a novel, every line is supposed to either advance the plot or develop a character, right? There's not just a whole bunch of fluff in there that doesn't do anything. Similarly, when you're writing your papers, every line should move you towards your thesis, either by developing the arguments you're going to, to try to defeat or developing the argument that you're going to present. So every single line in your paper should move you somehow towards defending your thesis. There shouldn't be a whole lot of, I mean, and it's, it'll probably happen to you that you find something, oh, this is kind of interesting, and just you wish you could just write a, three paragraphs of an aside about it. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see just a collection of interesting thoughts. I want it to all be a linear progression towards your thesis. That's why I need your thesis up front so I can immediately start telling whether this content is moving you towards it or not. Okay, so you're gonna give me an abstract. The abstract does not count towards your word count. That's sort of separate from the word count. Uh, you're gonna start in on the, on the paper proper. You're gonna talk about, you're gonna do an introduction. This is, so the abstract is mandatory. The rest is just strongly recommended. Uh, an introduction and the content of your introduction uh, is a more extended description of what your paper is about. You can do a broad literature review here. So again, we'll use the example of prototype theory. Like, here are some important papers in the history of prototype theory. This is a good place to cite, like, the course readings, stuff like that. Uh, and so you say, here's the main topic. We're doing prototype theory. Here's what the question that I'm going to attack. So you describe the debate that you're going to engage in. And then you describe overall, you give me kind of a mini map of where your paper is going to go. So this is just a less compressed version of the abstract. Uh, then you're going to do the main body where you're doing the moves. So you're going to dive in and give a detailed description of some of your sources. So I said the kind of five to 10 sources is recommended. Not all of those five to 10 sources have to be things that you describe in great detail. Actually, a really good paper might only look closely at one or two sources, right? So a really good paper might say, I'm looking at prototypes, here's a paper that makes a claim, and then I'm gonna critique it in detail. So you, in that case, you'd really only be describing in detail one of those sources. So that happens in the main body. After you set up the kind of context and background, you dive into the main body where you describe in detail the thing that you're gonna argue about, you present your argument, and then do a conclusion where you kind of review where you've gotten, talk about maybe open questions, questions that you would like to have gotten in your research, that kind of thing. Okay, so just a recommend, recommendation for your structure. Uh, hands up if you've written a paper this long before at university level. Hands up if you haven't. Okay, okay. So like a significant number of you haven't. Uh, this is going to be challenging because writing is an important skill. It's a hard skill. You wouldn't expect to just pick up a violin and be good at it. Similarly, you can't expect to just start writing and be good at it. So this is going to be work for you. Um, but it's totally worthwhile because hopefully if you get a good job, it will involve words in some manner or other. So writing well is a skill that hopefully all of you are going to use at least a little bit in the rest of your life. Okay. So let me recommend, moving forward, here's what I recommend that you do. Here's a kind of recommended strategy for you in trying to get, your, get yourself kind of wrapped, like engaged in this essay. So step one is to choose a topic. If you haven't read the topics already, read them, think about them, and choose one I recommend based on which one sounds interesting to you. Uh, because n there's no way to write an essay and it'd be totally easy, as far as I know. Maybe you're a prodigy. I have never written an essay and was like, that was totally easy. So trying to find the easiest one is maybe not the right 
method, trying to find one that you're interested in is far better because your interest will sustain you through the long dark nights of trying to slog through this thing. Your interest will keep you afloat. So pick the one that you find most interesting or engaging. Okay, then step two, whichever you're doing, just read the readings from this class. That's a good start. There will be references in there that you can use. And then you move on to what I'm gonna call aggressively skimming the literature. Aggressive skimming is a fantastic tool. Uh, it's a tool that every grad student learns. Uh, it's a tool that every researcher has to draw on. So aggressive skimming is when you, you try to get as much as possible, as quickly as possible, without diving too deep into what's going on. Uh, you, a lot of people, and I had this when I, when I first started in grad school, I had this thing where I felt I had to read every word of everything that I engaged in or I wouldn't have properly engaged it. Uh, and that's good, that's a good thing to do. You wanna be a deep reader, but you also wanna have another gear in your gearbox of aggressive skimming. So you're looking at the titles. If the title sounds like, oh, maybe that's something I'm interested in, then you download it and read the abstract, the first few pages maybe. And if it's something that's like, oh, okay, this could, this could be worthwhile, then you save the file in a folder that you've created and then move on and just keep branching through the literature, kind of gleaning bits of it that look like they're potentially relevant. Uh, once you've done some of that, you've kind of got your, like, a, a little collection of papers maybe that seem interesting to you. Now it's time to actually read some of them. Actually read them in detail, so you shift into your deep reading mode and, like, go through them and think about them, make notes on them. When I'm doing this, I almost inevitably print them out and read them on paper and make notes by hand on them. That's, for me, that's a winning strategy. You don't have to do that, but that works for me really well. Yeah? Are we all trying to use together with kind of respect to our argument, or are we just kind of presenting order because we've covered Well, we discussed at the beginning that you're defending a thesis. Well, presumably some of them will be defend will pre be presenting at a view that you agree on and some that you disagree on. Right. Yeah. That's right. You're taking you're you're selecting bits and pieces from each of these. Okay. Uh, so yeah yeah. Let's say the example of Florida theory or something where we had numbers like how someone found something. Mm -hmm. So how do you cite those things then? I'm sorry, I don't, uh, how do you cite them? Yeah, so in a sense like, how do you put them in the argument? Do you like have like an appendix or something where we cite the whole table or something where we take specific value from or? Um, you can do that, you can do that if you think it's important. Uh, in the past, I've very rarely seen any of these papers hinge on the specific, not like a whole table of numbers. Uh, typically, what you would do is cite the paper and extract the conclusion from it. So you say, they, they did an experiment that found this. And you just say what they found rather than presenting all of their evidence. Yeah? Okay. Good. Okay. So, uh, Okay, so you've aggressively skimmed the literature a little bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit in a minute about what's, what the tools you're gonna to use to do that. You're gonna have found, if something, almost everything that you aggressively skim, you're gonna go, nah, that's not really interesting or that's not really what I'm looking at. You'll pick out a few things that are potentially interesting and then you read them, make notes on them, do what's called an annotated bibliography. So you've got uh, when I do this, I've just got a file with the citation, and then I just type in some notes on them, kind of extracting the point for you from these papers. Uh, and then you come, and then at this point, you come up with a tentative thesis. So you've done a lot of, do the, basically I'm recommending you do a bunch of reading first, and then come up with your thesis. But it's just a tentative thesis, you're not obliged to stick to it. Yeah? Are you going to be available anywhere in the break if we contact you with questions? Or sure, of course. Uh, so I'll be here on Tuesday with your marked tests and I'm available via email. It's about a 40 minute commute for me to be here. So email's probably preferable other than on the Tuesday. Uh, yeah. Are we being marked as an attestation of the No, no, no. This is just a thing that I'm suggesting that you do for your own, because they're actually a useful, I know this is sometimes a standalone project, but 
this, it's actually a super useful thing to do if you're trying to dive into a literature you don't know because you'll, here's what happens to me if I don't do this. I read a bunch of stuff and there's a bunch of ideas that I think are important and then I cannot remember where those ideas were. And I have to read a bunch of stuff again to find them. So these notes are just sort of your own personal guide, just as minimal as you want to remind yourself where the ideas that you thought were important can be found. Uh, so you, I usually put page numbers so I can find it in the text again. And then when you're going to actually write your paper, you've got this document of just here's the juicy bits from all of the pay, all the stuff I read, and you can quickly grab it from your annotated bibliography and stick it in your paper. Yeah. So. And then you begin writing the paper. So this is my recommended methodology for you for now. Uh, so how to get started on this stuff. Questions so far? Yeah. Um, I know that the people said that they had essays. Yes, they do. That you could look at. Yes, they do. What time or so you'd go to their office hours. Okay. Yeah. So that's listed on Quercus. So uh, if you've uh, just, this is a good point. So CASA has got a, a essay bank, past essays from this course that did well. So if you'd like to look at the kind of typical structure of these essays, what kind of things they argue for, that's a really nice resource for you. I think it's Monday afternoons that they're there. Um, yeah, and they can, they'll be there, and if you want to run ideas by them, that's a nice resource. They'll be happy to talk to you about what makes a good essay, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Okay, let me show you some uh, research tools. I, okay, so I'm sorry if this is super familiar to some of you. For some of you, this will be super familiar. For some of you, you'll have never heard of these things before in your life. I got to about my third year at this university before anybody told me that I have access to practically every journal from modern history online, uh, which I was very upset by. I was very, felt very betrayed that nobody let me know. So here you go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this right now. Okay, so, Google Scholar, JSTOR, U of T Libraries, and U of T Librarians are my, my strong recommendations. So, uh, the, the U of T Library search engine is okay. It's fine, it's not very clever, so here I'm just gonna, this is an experiment. So this is one of the readings, I'm just gonna copy paste the title of it. And I can, it will give me something, hopefully. Ah, there we go. Osherson and Smith. So if you're looking to download a paper, here's one way of doing it. Da da. But this is kind of slow. The search engine is not that good. So if you make a tiny mistake, it won't know what you're talking about. Sometimes when I put in the title of a paper, it still can't find it, despite it being in the library collection. So I kind of recommend this as your search engine of last resort, uh, because it's really not that clever. Here are two much better search engines, and here's one that I particularly like, Google Scholar. If you haven't seen Google Scholar before, this is a marvelous tool. This is my, like, my go-to research tool. So once again, I'm just gonna put in the title of this paper, and it's giving me a couple things that I'd like to point out to you here. So uh, one thing is you can just click on this and download the paper, so that's nice. You have direct access to it. You have direct access to this as not a U of T student, by the way. This is not a U of T sanctioned thing. This is just anybody who wants to do scholarly research. Mo like a lot of papers will be online. So that's handy. A Couple of other things are super handy. So if you wanna, if you want to start from somewhere, so suppose I start from this paper on the adequacy of prototype theory as a theory of concepts. If I want to go back in time, I just look at the bibliography, right? If I want to know what these guys are citing, that's pretty straightforward. There's a list at the end of the paper of all the things that they're citing. But what if I want to know who cited this paper? Google Scholar has the answer. So you click on cited by, and this gives me access to all of the papers that Google is aware has cited this paper. So this is a tool that you can use to go forward in time and look at where the discussion has gone since that paper. This is magical for me, because I don't, I don't know how people did without Google Scholar back in the day. Like I really don't know how they, I really don't know how you do research without this tool. Okay, so that's incredibly helpful. 
uh, things that have cited that paper are probably going to be on roughly the same topic. You still have to do some skimming, some aggressive skimming to find stuff that's relevant, but this is super, super helpful. Here's another thing that's super, super helpful in Google Scholar. See these two little quotation marks down here? Click on that, and it gives me perfectly cited citations, perfectly formatted citations that I can then copy and paste into my bibliography. I'm going to ask you to do APA style. This is APA style. So here it is, a perfectly formatted APA style citation. You don't have to do any of the finicky little messing around, trying to get it right. This is, I live by this. This is amazing. Okay? Okay, so Google Scholar, incredibly helpful. Uh, yeah? Should we be going for articles with more citations or Okay, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, so the cited by number is relevant in a couple of ways. One, that it's a, if it's got a high number, that means it's a central paper. It's a paper that lots of people have talked about, lots of people have referred to. That number, by the way, is basically like your value as a scholar. Like this is the number that really defines how important you are in the scholarly world, which is a kind of sad and story. Sorry, you think it would be like your humanity or your the quality of your ideas, but no, just that number. So. Uh, Finding, finding papers with a high number of cited by, that tells you at least that it's an important, important central uh, topic. But that doesn't mean that it's a, necessarily the only thing you want to read, or it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the only place where good ideas are. Especially newer papers, so if you find something from 2018, it's going to have a much lower number there, but that doesn't mean that you should ignore it. So I'm not going to be checking how many people have cited your papers. So that's not important to me. Just the quality of the ideas that are being presented are what I'm going to be thinking about. Yeah? So let's say, for instance, you don't have a name of a paper. Like, like yeah. right now, you're starting from the point of mm. having, like, some type of Good. Let's say you're starting from a concept, like um, yep. the finitary finitary. How would you talk about it? OK, so good question. So how do you do if you don't have the title of a paper? So Google Scholar, the, one of the lovely things that you can do with this is just, oh, yes. Yes, I did. Uh, so Google's smart enough to deal with my spelling errors, and it's also smart enough if you just search by topic. Now, searching by topic will give you a less sort of relevant result, but it's still results. So this is the paper that I just searched for by title. It's the first thing that comes up, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff on prototype theory, cognitive models and prototype theory, prototype theory and fuzzy sets, no, 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 no. So you can just search by topic. Sometimes you'll have to do something like, uh, prototype theory psychology to make sure it's on the psychology side of things. Uh, but you can just, in Google Scholar, you can just type in the topic that you're interested in and it will give you a bunch of stuff on it. Uh, here's another tool that's also good for this question, which is JSTOR. JSTOR is another one that has a really nice search engine. It's really like high quality searches. So, uh, we would, okay, so I've already logged in. It, it'll ask you to log in as a U of T person. You just use your U of T ID, the same thing you use to log into your email. Put that into JSTOR and it will give you access. And now if I say uh, prototype psychology, it will give me a whole bunch of results and almost all of them have this download PDF button. So you, this is like results plus the paper. So Google Scholar has some of the PDFs. JSTOR has a lot more of them. And you can do things like sort by subject. So suppose the subject that I'm interested in is ta -da, psychology. Click there. And now I've got only articles that it thinks are in the subject of psychology. Yeah? OK. Uh, now, I mentioned that the U of T, so is there any questions about these tools? So these are just ways of getting into the literature. You're going to download a whole bunch of stuff that's not relevant. When you find something that looks like it's potentially relevant, you want to save it to like a project file. In that project file, you're going to develop a bunch of like rough summaries of what's, what you're talking about. 
and you'll just sort of slowly develop a sense of some part of the literature. When some part of the literature grabs you, then you can start thinking about your thesis. So really don't worry about your thesis until you've read a bunch of stuff. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the UFT library search engine is not awesome, but you know who is awesome? U of T librarians. U of T librarians are amazing. So U of T library. Did you know that there are humans whose job it is to help you do research at this university? And that part of your tuition is goes to paying their salary so that they're just sitting there waiting for you to come ask them. So ask uh, for research help. Sorry, this is not ideal. Oh my god, okay. It works better on Chrome. All right, come on now. So research help. Oh my, okay, anyway. You click on this ask thing and you can, you can chat with them uh, online some of the time. You can go to the library and say, hey, I'm trying to do some research for psychology cogsci and I don't know what I'm doing, please help. And they are there, their job is to help you do that research. And most of the time they just sit there sad and alone, waiting, waiting for somebody to come to make them do their job, their actual job, which is to help you find information that would be relevant to you. So if you want like human level support on doing this research, there's people whose job that is. So go talk to your librarian. Uh, the science libraries, Gerstein is one particular, like they specialize in science stuff. So if you go to Gerstein, go up to the service desk and say, hi, I'm an undergrad, I'm trying to do this paper, can you help me find some sources? They, they will help you, okay? Okay, so. So there you go. Some helpful research tools to get you going. Uh, yeah, you wanna decide broadly what topic you're dealing with first, but after you've decided that, I mean, don't, you might have a feeling of panic wash over you to say like, oh no, I don't know what I'm gonna say about this thing. That's not the stage that you're at yet. If you've just decided what your topic is, you're not expected to know anything about it or have an opinion about it yet. Just start reading about it and then something will grab you, hopefully. And then once you've done some reading, then you'll be ready to formulate a thesis. Then you'll be able to be ready to write your paper. Like 1500 words, uh, I don't know what you would type, maybe say you type like 100 words a minute, that's pretty fast, but like, that means that your actual writing of the paper will take about 15 minutes, right? So the actual typing part, once you've got all the ideas sorted out, is a relatively trivial space. Say you're only typing 50 words a minute, that's 30 minutes, that's half an hour of actual typing. That's not the hard part. The hard part is doing the research and thinking about it, digesting it, coming up with an idea, refining your idea, all that stuff, okay? So all of that is the real heavy lifting of this project, not the final typing it out. So don't get too eager to get to the final typing it out stage, okay? Okay. Uh, I've uploaded this integrity checklist to the Quirkus. I mean, uh, in past years I had people actually physically staple a copy of this signed onto their essays, but we're just doing up electronic submissions, so we're not gonna do that this time. But you should familiarize yourself with this thing. Uh, things like, I have acknowledged the use of another ideas with accurate citations. So if you get an idea from somebody else, you are obliged to cite them. And that means not just, uh, so we'll talk about what that means in just a second. Uh, let's see, if I paraphrase the work of others, I put the idea into my own words, didn't just change a few words or rearrange the sentences. I've checked my work against my notes to make sure I've correctly referenced all direct quotes or borrowed ideas. I've gotten this one a few times where I catch somebody for plagiarism and they say, oh, it was just an error. I copy pasted that from my notes. I thought it was my own work. Turns out it wasn't. That is not an acceptable excuse. That doesn't get you off the hook. So you have to confirm that everything that somebody else is is properly cited for them, okay? Uh, my bi bibliography includes only the sources used to complete this assignment. So here's one. 
you're not allowed to pad out your bibliography with a bunch of stuff that you didn't cite. Yeah, that's also cheating. So your bibliography should include all of the things that you cite, all of the ideas that you use from somebody else, but only the ideas that you use from somebody else. Yeah? Uh, this is the first time I've submitted this assignment for credit. Did you know that you can plagiarize yourself? It's true. You can plagiarize yourself. This is an academic offense to submit the same essay for two different classes or even to submit substantially the same effort. So if you copy pasted two, three pages from some other essay from, that you wrote for a different class, submit it to me, that's an academic offense. Why? It's because you're getting twice the credit for the, half the work. You're, you're getting the credit for having done the work in two classes, but you only did work in one class. This is not my rule, this is the university's rule. This is an academic offense. However, you can do the following. You can cite yourself. You can cite your previous essay, and that's no longer plagiarism. Just the same way you can use some, you're perfectly free to use somebody else's ideas so long as you cite them. You can use your own ideas so long as you cite yourself. Um, and that's probably not gonna be super relevant to your first essay, but on the second essay where the topic is open, some of you will find the following. You'll say, I was not crushed and demoralized by writing this essay. Actually, I think I have more stuff to say about this. I'd like to expand on my first essay. And then it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do to say, I'm gonna continue to develop this idea that I started in my first essay. I'm gonna just do more of it in a more extensive way. And anything you use from your first, you're perfectly free to use ideas from your first essay so long as you cite yourself. Okay? Uh, Proofreading, any proof, so you're, it's perfectly okay to have somebody else proofread your essay, but they're only allowed to indicate where there's problems, you have to fix them. So in your final essay, every single word has to be written by you. So do that. Uh, this is the final version of my assignment, not a draft. I've never gotten this one, never had somebody. Sometimes people will submit a, something and then five minutes later be like, oh no, I sent the wrong paper, that's fine. Uh, but if you find out two weeks later, after you get your mark back, you say, oh, I submitted the wrong one. That's not going to fly. I'm just going to use the one you submitted to me. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's basically that. Uh, let me talk a little bit about APA format. Uh, APA format, in a strict sense, has got a whole lot of rules. I don't care about most of them. Here's the, here are the rules that I do care about. I would like a cover page. I would like an abstract of around 200 words. I would like page numbers, and I would like in-text citations. Let me tell you what in-text citations are. So here's something that's unacceptable. I will not accept this. You write a whole paper with no citations in it, and then just stick a bibliography at the end, because that's defeating the purpose of having citations. The purpose of having citations is so that I know where the ideas you're using on each line are coming from. So you need citations in the text itself, so you say, Here's an idea, citation, and then that short thing, so your author date, so the last name of the author, comma, the date of the paper, and then that's in your bibliography. So if you just have a bunch of stuff in your bibli bibliography, that doesn't count as citing it, and in fact, that's also an academic offense. So if you, just, if you cite the thing that you used in your bibliography but didn't tell me in the text that that's where that specific idea was coming from, that's also an academic offense. Uh, and of course, you need a bibliography. Yeah? What should the cover page look like? Um, it should have the following things on it. It should have an informative title. It should have your name, the course code, and the date that you handed it in. Not the due date, the date that you actually handed it in. Uh, informative title, it used to be that the title was the only advertising your paper got. So don't give me a title like CogSci Paper 1. That's not very informative. Tell me something about this is all in service of training you to deal with information overload, not on the receiving end, on the sending end. Uh, training you to be able to help society cope with the fact that there's just way the heck too much information available to everybody. And the way that we all collectively contribute to solving that is by giving things like informative titles. So you can just look at the title and assess whether that's going to be important or interesting to you going forward. Uh, and the same thing with the abstract. So your abstract should describe your topic as well as a thesis you'll defend about that topic. 
and its purpose is to make your paper aggressively skimmable. I get a lot of students who do the mystery novel uh, version of a paper, which is they save the thesis to the very last paragraph. And so there are contexts in which that is a reasonable way to write. If you're writing blog posts or you're writing a jour in journalistic style, one of the things that they do is try to, try to draw you in and get you to get to the end of the thing. So you only give the kind of punchline at the end of the thing. And for their purposes, that makes perfect sense. I'm not saying they're writing incorrectly. Perfectly legitimate way to write. But when you're writing in academic context, we're trying to get as much upfront as possible. Don't give me a mystery novel. Give me, you know those movies where they like kind of show you the ending and then go 10 years before. Do that. Do that. Okay. Uh, Talking about having reference at the end is not sufficient. Just check out an APA style guide to see what these are supposed to look like. Usually it's, uh, you know, the prototype theory was developed by so-and-so. And then you say author, comma, year. Or if you're talking specifically about the author, you say Smith developed the prototype theory. Uh, or you say the prototype theory was developed by Smith, bracket, year. Something like that. Okay? Uh, bibliography. At the end, you include all and only the citations you use in the text. And again, look at the style guide, or just pick out the APA formatted Google Scholar citations that I just showed you. Okay, so that's it for my essay advice. Questions about the essays? Okay, so feel free to email me at any point. If you've got any questions about these things, I'll try my best to kind of quickly get back to you. Um, yeah, obviously you're not gonna be doing your own original psychology research, so what you're gonna do is look at some psychology research and tell me how it relates to different psychological theories, right? So there's gonna be an empirical component, some studies that somebody did, and you're gonna read those from the literature. There's gonna be a theoretical component, so claims that people make about what those studies mean, and your job is going to be to either promote or try to refute one of the theories that's already presented. I strongly recommend you don't try to come up with your own theory of memory or attention or categorization. That's too much for this first essay. It's probably too much for anything that you're gonna do in undergrad. Uh, that's a lot, that's, that's a lot. So just, just either support or try to show pick holes in one of the existing theories. Strongly recommend. Yeah? So very often in writing essays, we have a theory which we get from somewhere and we have to show the pros and cons. Do we ever do that, do that in the essay as well? Or do, do we just select one side of the argument and just have all the arguments towards that? That's a good question. That's a good question. So, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so suppose that I'm trying to show that prototype theory is not adequate. You need to include something about why people thought it was adequate, but you would put that kind of early in the, so in the introduction, you would say, here's prototype theory, here's some of its strengths, but after that, you, you can just present criticisms. So you don't have to, very, very common essay structure is present the argument and then present possible counter arguments and refute them. You're allowed to do that if you want, you're not required to do that. So if you're just like, I just think this theory is wrong, you don't have to pretend to think it's right for a paragraph and then show why you were pretending. You can just say, I think it's wrong because da 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 da. Uh, so it's, a, it's not that long of an essay, 1500 words. There's not that much room to do stuff. So if you're just presenting criticisms, just present criticisms. Yeah? Basically, you want us to structure the essay the way you structure the class. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, something like that, something like that. So what I've been doing is maybe, that's interesting. It's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of it that way. So, uh, yeah, in class I'll do like, here's a theory, here's some good things about it, and here's why it's not working. That's, that's kind of been the rhythm of a whole bunch of this class. So that's a perfect, I obviously like that structure. So if you do that structure, I, I would probably like that too. Uh, I don't want to impose a specific structure because sometimes the thing that you're writing will kind of call out for something different. And that's okay too, but these are just sort of strong recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so I'd like you to put it in your own words. Yeah, I would like you to put it in your own words. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would the audience for this essay be you? Yeah, good question. So who's your audience? The audience is me, uh, which means, so the, this makes a big difference because who your audience is determines how much you need to explain about what. Um, but you, some things to know about me in this context. So uh, if I've gone over and over something in class, that means that you can probably assume it without explaining it too much. But I'm also cynical and skeptical. So I would like for you to, it might be a good idea if it's something complex, to show me that you understand it. So you're not explaining, you're not necessarily explaining this stuff completely from scratch as though I don't know anything about the topic. But it's also a good idea to say ideas in your own words to demonstrate that you've got a grasp of them. Yeah? Good. Other questions? Yeah? That's fine, yeah. If you're plus 10%, the, so plus, fifth, yeah, so 1650, not including your abstract, you will lose no marks for that. But uh, if, it goes too, if it goes too long, then that's a, that's a writing problem. So that'll, that'll come out. Remember I gave you a sort of breakdown of where your marks are gonna come from? Quality of writing, one of the things that I'm looking for is can you keep it within the word count? If some of the quotes are really Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And big, I would uh, note on quotes, big block quotes are sometimes very convenient because it helps fill up the word count. But a big block quote doesn't show me that you understand what's inside the quotation. So it's a good idea if you're going to use a big block quote, it's a good idea to re-explain it immediately afterwards in your own words to show that you know what, you, what you're thinking. And it's probably even better if instead of doing like, 300 word block quotes, you explain it in your own words. So we can just do like citations to work and then Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Doing all right. Other questions? Okay. So if there's no other questions, wow, we used up almost an hour. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, does the 1,500 words uh, also count the abstract? No, it doesn't count the abstract. It doesn't count the abstract. Yeah, yeah. This is worth spending time on, I think. I think this is because this is the bit that's relevant to the mark you get in this class. Let's, let's do this thoroughly. Yeah. Should we defend our thesis against the criticism? So... You should give, a, give me an argument for your thesis. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a criticism that occurs to you as an obvious one, that's probably, it's kind of part of your argument. But I do not need you to invent a criticism to then knock down. So I'm not necessarily looking for that move. Uh, it's a good move to make in a lot of cases. So you, you make an argument and then you think, oh, what about this problem? Uh, then refuting that problem is often a good move to make, but I'm not requiring it or necessarily looking for it. If you just give me a straight argument against the view that you're de trying to defeat, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think if there's anything else, I think that's basically it. Okay. Real quick review and then we'll take a break. Okay, so last time we were talking about this Descartes-Hobbes debate, and that was the kind of, that was the crucial bit from that whole last, I, I know last lecture was quite kind of rambling and broad, and we covered several thousand years of history. Here's the bit, here's the kind of punchline, here's the crucial bit of this, uh, that we got from the scientific worldview, the sci sorry, the scientific revolution worldview. I don't, I, we shouldn't conflate the current scientific worldview with what was going on in Descartes and Hobbes' time, but this is kind of the point at which we get AI, and also we get the argument for dualism. That is the idea that the mind is an immaterial thing that can't be reduced down to mechanical stuff. So 
Hobbes very reasonably from the ideas of the scientific revolution said, I think that we are mechanisms, that we are just machines that operate according to mechanical rules and that that's what thinking is. And this gives us the kind of hope of AI. If we're just machines, then it should be possible to build a thinking machine. In every way that we think, in every way that we have a mind, it should be possible to build a machine that has those properties. And then Descartes says, aha, however, given this scientific worldview that you've got, the scientific revolution, mechanical worldview, uh, I think we can conclude that minds are definitely not material. Because what you told us, you scientific revolution people, was that the world hasn't got any meaning in it. It hasn't got any purposes in it. It hasn't got uh, the things that are absolutely crucial to thinking, which is the ability to understand the meaning of symbols. Right? If you've just got symbols that are moving around without any anybody understanding them, then they are not thinking. That's not a thinking process. So the blind, unintelligent, ununderstanding manipulation of symbols is not thinking. But that's what you told me that the world is capable of. The blind, unthinking, mechanical manipulation of symbols. I am clearly a thinking thing, clearly from Descartes' perspective at least. So he thinks it's just obvious that we are thinking things. You can tell that from the first person perspective. I feel that I'm thinking in this very direct way. Therefore, Descartes says, the mind is forever beyond the study of natural science. Because natural science can only study things that are material. Uh, that's, a, that's a bold conclusion. Hobbes' conclusion is fairly bold too. Notice that it entails the following. You don't have a soul because you're just a machine. Machines don't have souls. You don't have an immortal soul like most people at the time thought you had, at least in, in Europe. It's not a super new conclusion. Lots of people in history have come to that conclusion, but it was a kind of shocking thing for Hobbes to have said. We're just machines. When you break apart a machine, where does the, where does the function of the machine go? When you break a calculator, where will all the calculations go? Nowhere, they're just gone. So when a, when a person breaks apart, where does the thinking go? Nowhere, it's just gone. Now, Descartes didn't like that. Descartes a Catholic. He would like to preserve the idea of an immortal soul. But that's, notice that that wasn't the argument that he made, right? He didn't make an argument from, well, I believe in Jesus and he loves us, therefore we live forever. That was not at all the argument that he made. The argument that he made was, I'm going to pay attention to the absolute best scientific theorizing available to me, and I'm going to observe some basic facts about my own perspective, put those two things together, and then come to the conclusion of dualism, the idea that the mind and the body are fundamentally separate things. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly clear up a few things that we kind of felt. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Does, does Um, so Hobbes can talk about that. For Descartes, it was very binary. It was very binary to the point where he concluded that it's okay to uh, be cruel to animals because they act like they have feelings, but they're just acting like that. They put on the display of having a perspective, but that's just a display so you can do whatever you want to animals. So for him, it's a totally on or off thing. You've, you're either ensouled or you are not. Uh, Hobbes can perfectly well say, actually, I think there's a continuity between animals and humans. Animals are just mechanisms. We're just mechanisms that are slightly fancier. So for him, there can be a, there can be a gradation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me just real quick, we'll do a break soon, but let me really quickly go over some stuff that I think I didn't explain particularly well last time. So one, la one more pass through this stuff, we'll get on to new stuff. So what is a mechanism? They say the mechanical, I was talking about the mechanical worldview. What did I mean by a mechanism? 
So a mechanism is a system that operates only in terms of the physical properties of its parts and its inputs, right? So there's nothing relevant to the operation of a mechanism other than the physical qualities of the parts of it and whatever kind of input you put in there. So a clock is a mechanism. It's just churning and churning. You need to wind it up. That's a kind of input. You need to set the time. That's a kind of input. But having done those two things, the only things that are relevant to the operation of the clock are the, qual the properties of its parts. OK, so here's another attempt to explain the paradox of mechanical reasoning. So let me do this in slightly different words. Hopefully, it'll be, it will be clearer. So mechanisms, we just said, react only to physical forces. Uh, a mechanism can manipulate meaningful symbols, right? So your computer can read you, it can print, present to you an audiobook. Your computer can present symbols which to you are meaningful, right? That's no problem. However, it can't do so be, in terms of their meaning because meaning doesn't have a physical force, right? It's not a physical, so if I write down the word book, it's got a bunch of physical properties. It's got four letters, some of them are round, right? Those are physical properties of the word book. But the meaning of that word is not a physical property of it. It's not in the symbol itself. It's something that we bring to the symbol, right? So if what we are is a mechanistic symbol manipulator and mechanisms can only react to the physical properties of things, that means they are not reacting to the meaning of them because the meaning is not a physical thing. Okay, so that's the paradox of mechanical reasoning. It seems like if you're reasoning, you must be sensitive to the meanings, but meaning isn't in the physics Right? There's no meaningometer you can point at a thing to determine its meaning. So you're either not really reasoning on the basis of the meaning of things, or there's something more to meaning than the mere mechanisms. So here's a way you could dissolve this paradox. It's not that hard to dissolve. Well, it's not, it's not hard to imagine how a thing that would dissolve this paradox. Build a mechanism that responds to meanings. Find some way of encoding the meaning in physical properties. So you don't have to just have to have the word book. Maybe the word book links you to a whole bunch of other symbols that cash out the meaning of the word, right? That's how an artificial intelligence would do it. It wouldn't just move the word book around. It would have a whole bunch of associated physical symbols that maybe give you the meaning of the word book. So if you can create a computer that can be sensitive to meanings, you've dissolved the paradox of mechanical reasoning. And that's presumably what we're trying to do with AI. But we haven't done it yet, I claim. There is no computer in the world that can read a 10-page document and tell you what it means. That's a, that's a skill that, that's only exclusive to humans currently. I might have to change that example in five years, but right now, there's nothing else that can do that task. Okay. And we talked about the problem of qualitative experience, the seeming of the apparent fact that we all have consciousness. We'll come back to this at the end of the course. I take it that it's kind of a mystery how it is consciousness arises from a purely physical process. Um, people have theories, though. There are, there are theories on the books about how this works. We will talk about them. Um, OK, and the problem of original meaning. So, let me try this one again. I, I definitely felt like I was not explaining this one well. So the meaning of a public symbol, like a word in a book, comes from the meanings of the thoughts that they evoke. So when you're reading a book, you are the one who's giving meaning to the words, right? The meaning that you derive from that book is a combination of the symbols on the page and you, the intelligent agent, knowing what they mean. So that's something you bring to the table. Okay. But what if now we say, you are just a mechanical symbol manipulator, right? You are just manipulating symbols according to rules. How is it that your thoughts, which are symbols, get their meaning? This is deeply related to the paradox of mechanical reasoning. I hope, I hope you can see. 
So if we are just abstract symbol manipulators, how do the tokens in your head get their meaning? And don't tell me that it's because you give it to them, because that's circular. Yeah? Can symbol manipulators um, manipulate the symbols of another manipulator and I guess give it thoughts, if you will? That's what we do. Right? We're, we're symbol manipulators that manipulate the symbols of other symbol manipulators. Uh, and so when you write your essay for me, you will provide me with some symbols that I will then derive meaning from because I'm a, a, a at least mildly intelligent agent who can who can understand the meaning of symbols. Yeah, so that seems like that seems right. But it's got to come from somewhere, right? There needs to be some origin to this point. So if if my understanding is just a bunch of meaningless symbols as well, manipulated according to just the physical properties of the tokens, then it's a mystery where the meaning comes from in the first place. Okay. Uh, just really like to briefly clarify meaning a little. Let's tease this apart a little. So meaning can mean at least two things. It can mean the object being picked out or so the reference. If I say apple, I'm picking out all the apples or maybe a specific apple. Uh, but also there's a sense to it, right? So the sense is the thought being expressed. So if I pick out something that's an apple with my word, that's fine. So as to say there's a specific apple that I'm referring to, I could also be referring to it as red or as fruit or as juicy or something like that, right? So the reference is the same in all of those cases, but the sense is different. I'm picking out different aspects of the same thing. So meaning refers to both of those things. Uh, and that hopefully will help clarify a little bit about the, this stuff of the causal theory of meaning. So here's a, here's a kind of bad attempt to solve the problem of original meaning. Maybe we can formalize meaning just in terms of whatever caused me to have the idea is the thing that that idea means. So I see an apple, it causes the idea in my head apple, therefore that's what it means because it's causally responsible for the thought. Uh, but then you, it's very unclear how you say things like which causes generate the thought, which causes are responsible, and which meanings do they bring up. So like we just said, the same object could bring into my, into my head apple or red or fruit and so on. So just being causally responsible is not enough to narrow down the meaning of the thought. Uh, there's also lots of kind of like, for a, for a botanist, this is a very specific type of thing, which, so their thoughts are created in this much more elaborate way about apples than mine are. I just see that and I go, they, I go apple. They might know about the evolutionary history. They might know the specific species, subspecies and all that stuff. Uh, so they're getting very different ideas from the same object. So just saying the object generates the idea, the meaning is clearly insufficient because we constantly have different ideas come from the same causal source. Uh, and then there's also, of course, non-causal ideas, cause ideas that aren't just referring to physical objects in the world. So like justice, there's a thing. What does justice look like? I don't know if I can pick out justice in the world just as a, as a matter of like what it looks like in physical terms, right? So, or the number, or the idea of evenness rather than oddness, even in odd numbers. Like I really don't know, that's not like a physical force impressing itself on my, that's an abstract, a thing I've abstracted from the, from the causal source. So let's start talking about AI, shall we? I've been promising this for two classes. So, Here's the, here's the potential of AI. We've been having a kind of rough go of it trying to figure out the mind through psychology. Uh, it has not been going really super well for us uh, in the sense of like coming up with really clear and easily defendable ideas. Uh, maybe instead of all that hassle, we could do the following. We could do what's called an engineering end run around the problem. So I'm gonna admit straight up I don't know a lot about American football. But as, as I understand the metaphor, uh, typically large men in body armor line up and then crash into each other. 
And an end run is when instead of crashing through the wall, you run the ball around the wall. Sorry, the egg, the hand egg. So you run the ball around the, the impenetrable wall of large body armored men and therefore avoid the problem. The end run is just sort of avoiding the problem that you were trying to, previously you were trying to crash through the problem. Now you're going to just go around the problem, yeah? So uh, the, the hope of AI, one of the things that you might be hopeful for when you're doing AI is it will do an end run around all of this messy psychology stuff. That is, instead of trying to empirically solve the questions of how the mind works, you build one, get it working, and then you've got a much nicer model to study. You open up a whole new realm, a whole new angle on which you can study the mind. For one thing, you built the thing. So that doesn't necessarily mean you understand it completely, but it does mean that you know something about how it was put together. For another thing, you're allowed to do a lot more stuff to an artificial intelligence than you are to humans. Humans are very fussy. They, they say things like, don't scoop out parts of my brain and don't put me in a sensory deprivation chamber for three months to see what happens, right? They really get really upset about that kind of thing and that's quite reasonable that we don't let them, those very strict ethical guidelines on what kind of research you're allowed to do on humans. And if you are aware of what psychologists did to rats in the 20th century, you'll, you'll know why. You shouldn't just let them do whatever they want. So uh, the engineering end run is a potential way to learn about the mind without having to drag ourselves through all of this messy psychology stuff. And just as a historical example, this seems to be a really effective way of studying aerodynamics. So before the Wright brothers, it was a fairly common thought that human flight is impossible. Like, uh, so to have an aircraft that is heavier than air, you can't have sustained flight. You, need, you can have a balloon, a hot air balloon, which creates something that's lighter than air, but just having a physical, like an a airplane that's heavier than air was impossible. We tried for a really long time to build airplanes based on bird wings, uh, because that's the example of flight that we're most familiar with. Try to understand how bird wings work. But aerodynamics are really hard, especially if you don't have supercomputers to simulate airflow. So what happened was they just built something, they just said, okay, never mind all that. Let's just build something that flies and then we'll go and like tinker around with it, see how it works and use our practical experience to then learn about aerodynamics in this kind of end run sort of way. So this has worked in the past. This, is, this has been a fruitful research strategy, at least in that case. So, Maybe it'll work for the mind too. And that's a, that's a very enticing thought. Um, here's the downside of using AI. So, and this is, we'll start talking about this today. We'll talk about this at much more length when we do the philosophy of mind at the end of the course. But it raises this serious question. Uh, what's the difference between simulated intelligence and actual intelligence? So how can you tell when the thing that you've built is genuinely intelligent versus when it's just kind of behaving intelligently? In relatively constrained contexts, you can build a machine that behaves as though it's smart, behaves as though it's reasoning, as though it's taking in meaning, understanding it, and generating meaningful responses. Uh, but I take it that currently, if you, if you scratch the surface of such machines, they turn out not to be really intelligent. That's not really a scientific problem in other areas, right? So we don't, we don't have this problem of like, is this really a particle accelerator or is it just a simulated one? That's not a question that other sciences have to deal with. Are we dealing with a genuine article or just a model of it? So I don't propose to try to answer this now. Uh, this is going to be an issue that kind of runs throughout our discussions of AI. It'll come up a bunch. But keep this in mind as a, as a kind of, as a hazard of doing AI research. And you might come to the conclusion that there is no difference or that the difference isn't super meaningful. So we'll talk at some length about the, what's the Turing test? Does everybody know this, the Turing test? Uh, so the Turing test is basically Alan Turing says, I don't care about that. And if it acts like it's intelligent, then it's close enough for me. So don't go messing around with all this what is intelligence really stuff. That's just, that's just waste, a waste of time. The Turing's test says 
if you, if you can fool me into thinking you're intelligent, that's all there is to it. So some people are gonna reject this question. Uh, we're gonna talk about whether it's a good move to do that or not, uh, but it's, it is a question that arises. Okay, so let's start in on formal systems. Okay, so we're starting in on formal systems because this was what's called the good old fashioned view of AI, the view of artificial intelligence that was the dominant one from kind of the middle of the 20th century up until the 1990s or so. So I told you that Hobbes thinks that thinking is just computation, uh, but what is computation? So uh, the traditional view is the following. Information is encoded in propositions. You recall what propositions are? They're statements about the world that can be true or false. Most of the things that we say are not propositions, or many of the things that we say are not propositions. So a question is neither true nor false, right? Is it raining outside? Is that true or false? It's neither. Or a command, somebody says, please sit over there. Is that true or false? That's neither, right? So only propositions, a special kind of sta statement, a statement that says something about the world, it asserts some state of affairs that could be either true or false. So information is a collection of propositions and propositions are collected are combined into logical structures. So I can say it is raining outside and I am wearing shoes. That's a, the and is a logical operator that connects those two propositions together. And then thinking on this view is the manipulation of propositions according to logical rules. So a very traditional view of computation. Um, these, by the way, are computers. This is what a computer was anytime up until about the 1950s, which is a row of typically women doing math problems. Uh, if you said computer in the early 20th century, what you meant was a person who computes. Uh, and it was a kind of, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a particularly highly regarded profession at the time, precisely because of the nature of computation, which is that it's supposed to operate according to formal rules. That is rules that you don't get to make any decisions about. So there's no decision making being conducted by these computers, or at least that was the idea. But notice here that there's a kind of ambiguity in this traditional view of computation. Here's the ambiguity. When you're manipulating these propositions, do you mean that you're manipulating them according to their meaning in an intelligent way or simply according to formal rules? So if it's simply formal rules, then there's literally no intelligence involved in um, um, computation, right? You're just saying, if I see this symbol, then I proceed to the, produce this symbol, right? There's no decision making, there's no intelligence, there's no insight, none of that stuff. Most of the time that we are manipulating propositions, there is all, all of that stuff. So you're manipulating propositions because you understand what they mean and you're trying to manipulate them in a way to produce meaningful results. And the traditional view of computation didn't really get this distinction crisp. It didn't really build this in as an important distinction. Uh, but we'll see that emerge through the kind of development of the philosophy of computation. Okay, so let's do some deep history of computation. Uh, this was one of the first mechanical computers. So when you get a mechanical computer, that ambiguity that I just discussed no longer is ambiguous because this thing can do some pretty simple math. So Charles Babbage uh, designed this machine, the analytical engine, uh, the first ever computer, it's a, it's a, in some sense, general purpose computer in the sense that it's programmable. So you can write a program and make this computer do different things. The very first one was developed by Ada Lovelace, the first ever computer programmer. Uh, so they, there was this analytical engine. They were also going to build a difference engine. Uh, so they could have built a mechanical programmable computer in the 19th century. The only problem was the engineering of it was too complex. So it would have required too many moving parts arranged in too com complex an arrangement, but their designs are still, 
around and people agree that it would if they could have built it, it would have worked. So at this point, if you're thinking about this as a computer, it's clear that this thing has no insight or understanding, right? This thing is not thinking in the sense of manipulating meaningful propositions. It's just doing mechanical, literally mechanical operations that produce a result according to very clear and well-specified rules, yeah? Okay, so there's some real deep history of computation. <clears throat> uh, in the 1930s or so, Alan Turing produces the kind of philosophical foundations for the theory of computation. Uh, so he gives a precise formal definition of computation. This, by the way, is my favorite example when people ask me what, what has philosophy done for us lately. Uh, Alan Turing thought about the philosophical question, what is computing anyway, really, really hard, and he changed the world by inventing electronic computers. So that's something philosophy's done for you lately. Um, okay, so his definition is framed in terms of what's called a Turing machine. Hands up if you've ever heard of a Turing machine. Some, many, good, good. Okay, so a Turing machine is something that he says can do anything that could be described as a rule of thumb or, or purely mechanical. It is a universal computer. That is to say, any program that could be, that could be uh, run by your phone or your laptop, any program that could be run by a standard computer could in principle be programmed into one of these things. And what he did was prove formally that any kind of series of mechanical manipulations can be run on a Turing machine, which means that this thing is a universal Turing machine. That it's a Turing machine that could do any program whatsoever. Uh, so it's got a couple of parts. The, they don't typically, so his thing, he didn't actually build this thing. It was just a, a an abstract description because it is an incredibly inefficient computer. It is not a fast computer. It's not a good computer. You wouldn't want to do anything with this, but it's nonetheless completely universal. So it's got a couple of parts. So it's got this, this thing in the middle here is a read write head. So it can either uh, read what's on the, this tape. This tape in theory is supposed to be infinite. You'll notice that it's finite, but that's just because we didn't have an infinite amount of tape. So uh, this tape has just got a bunch of ones and zeros on it, right? Bunch of ones and zeros in various positions. And in this read write head can either read whether it's a one, and one or a zero in that position or erase it and rewrite it. And so that's the tape. It's kind of its memory. It's got this read write head, which is like its input output device. And then it's got a table. So I guess it's in this box here, a table that tells it what to do. So it's got a series of rules of the following form. This big, sometimes really, really big tables, but it says if you're in position 357 and you see a one, then you should move to position 382, erase what's there and write a zero, right? It's just an extremely long list of that kind of rule. And using that incredibly pared down architecture, you can run any program any, like, that any computer currently existing today can run. Well, except for the quantum computers, yeah. There are, some, there are some very nerdy debates about whether uh, any computer at all could be instantiated on in a Turing machine, but uh, any of the normal computers that you're used to can all be shown to be formally equ or equivalent to something that this thing can do. Uh, a couple things to notice here. This would be super duper slow and inefficient. So what we're talking about when we're talking about the equivalence of these things is in no sense practical equivalence or engineering equivalence, right? It's not the case that this is just as good as any computer you can buy. In fact, for almost everything, this is vastly, vastly worse, right? So we're talking about uh, abstract symbol manipulation in a very abstract way. So highlight the abstract bit of, bit of that. We're not talking about the physical constraints of the system. We're not talking about how it's built, what materials it's made of, how quickly it goes. And that's gonna, the, the last one of those, how quickly it goes, is gonna turn out to be really important because the debate between kind of first generation AI and where we're at now 
is in some sense a debate between those people that think that timing and dynamics matters and those people who think that it doesn't. So uh, today we're going through the good old fashioned view of AI for whom the, the speed at which processes unfold is just irrelevant. It's not considered an important part of the description of the system, right? What's, import, what's considered an impor, important part of the description of the system is the rules that it operates by. Just the, the abstract formal rules by which it manipulates symbols. For the good old fashioned AI view, that was all you needed to know about the system, not what it's made of, how it works, any of that stuff. Okay, so just to flag that as an important issue going forward. Okay, so I'd like to take you through uh, a really classic kind of description of the good old fashioned AI view presented by John Haugelin in this book, The Art Artificial Intelligence, The Very Idea. This used to be the textbook for, or one of the textbooks for this course. The Walmsley text is nicer. It's a nicer read. It's a good read. Uh, this is kind of like old, I think it's from the 80s, but it's nonetheless a cl classic statement of this view. So he says, a computer is an interpreted, automatic, formal system. An interpreted, automatic, formal system. Uh, today we'll just be looking at what it means to be a formal system. So the rest of this lecture is just on what it means to be formal. And then next time we'll do, after the break, we'll do automatic and interpreted. So let's talk about what it means to be a formal system. Now, uh, probably the most familiar example to any of you who don't do computer programming of a formal system is a formal game. So not all, not all games are formal, not all formal systems are games, but you've probably played a formal game. So let's, let's go with this. So uh, chess is a formal game, that is to say, uh, it's got a bunch of properties that formal systems have. Uh, so formal systems have two, kind, two parts, basically. Tokens, which can be manipulated, and rules for manipulating those tokens. Yeah? Uh, and that's all you need. So the type of a token determines which rules will apply to it. So let's talk about the type token distinction. Uh, this is, comes up a lot in philosophy of mind, other, other philosophy. So uh, if you've got a bunch of change, right? Maybe you've got five quarters and three loonies. You've got two types of change, but uh, eight tokens. Similarly, we've got, so all of these, all the pawns are the same type but they're in distinct tokens of that type, right? So far so good. And the type of a token completely, in a formal system, which type the token is completely exhausts everything you need to know about it to know how to manipulate it. So the rules tell you how you're allowed to move each of these pieces, right? And furthermore, that's all you need to know about the pieces in order to know how to move them. So here's the nice thing about a formal system. It doesn't really matter that much how it's instantiated. It doesn't matter that much. You can play chess with little chess pieces. You can play chess with people. You could play chess electronically. You could play chess. Haugelin used the example. You could play helicopter chess. If you were an eccentric billionaire, you could have a whole bunch of helicopters landing on the roofs of buildings, and that would represent the moves in your chess game. I don't think you'd want to, but you could, right? And that doesn't make a difference to the game of chess, does it? The, the, the physical properties of the tokens only matter insofar as they tell you which rules apply to them. You don't use a different strategy for helicopter chess than you do for regular chess. The same, all of the same rules apply. The fact that these are people standing there that makes no difference to the game. 
right? To the formal dimension of the game, at least. So think about what that's going to mean for the theory that the mind is a formal system. It means that the way that your mind is instantiated in your brain doesn't matter. Yeah? Sure. Is that what you mean by how it's instantiated in your brain? I don't really follow. So, like, so let me let me try to explain more. Let me see if I can let me see if I can get it. So, okay. So, suppose that your mind is like a computer. Suppose that your mind is an abstract symbol manipulator. Right. That's what your computer does. It's got little electronic charges running around the various transistors that are the the effect of a various. Uh, charge will be determined by the rules that are sort of built into the chip, right? Oh, that was real amateurish, but you get the idea, yeah? Okay, so it's manipulating symbols in this abstract formal way. So if it gets a certain input, there are specific rules for how to deal, what to do when it gets that input, right? Now, your computer could be instantiating those rules in a variety of different ways. Right? So I take it that the chip design changes from year to year. The internal structure of an of a Intel chip is a different than an AMD chip. Right? So there's various ways to instantiate the same rules. You can run Microsoft Word on a Mac or a PC. Right? And the, the instantiation is different, but the rules at the level of which they're implemented are the same. Microsoft Word operates basically the same on a Mac and a PC, I take it, basically. So, if your mind is a formal symbol manipulator, this is kind of a hopeful idea for the possibility of developing AI, right? Because that means that you could run the same rules on a different material. And that's what AI is, right? AI is having a mind that's not running on a brain. And this is going to be the debate between that we're going to sort of deal with for the rest of the semester. Do the details of your brain matter? Does the, does the, fact, does the way that your mind is instantiated in a brain make a difference to the properties of the brain, or to the properties of your mind? Or is it something that you could uh, do the exact same thing in a totally different medium? Like as different as little wooden chess pieces and helicopters flying from rooftop to rooftop, right? Those are radically different ways of doing the same formal rules, but it doesn't make a difference. Yeah? So would that, would that be like for the rest of the course then? The, the question would be whether Human cognition is the is caused by intelligence, or if intelligence is the result of human cognition. Is that the is that the answer? So I don't think so. I don't think so. Is is it that intelligence is in and of itself a thing that can be expressed uh, either by a brain or by a machine or by some other possible thing? Like all these different things, although they're structured differently, can have intelli like intelligence. So intelligence is a thing. Or if like the ability, it, cognition itself, so like let's say the, the mechanics of the brain, how it's structured, no one's talking about things. Something specific about brains is what yep. causes intelligence. And therefore, right. if you were to build it in something else, it would have to be designed in the exact sort of same way for it to be. So that's, you're, on, you're on the right track there. Uh, it might be a little too strong that it has to be designed in exactly the same way. Um, but if it's a formal symbol manipulator, so this is the original, you know, the, the good old fashioned view of artificial intelligence is we're formal symbol manipulators. So in some sense, the brain is just irrelevant to understanding the mind. In the same way that 
like if you're trying to understand how to be a good chess player, you're not going to spend all day investigating the detailed wood grain on a pawn, right? That's not a good way to get better at chess. You don't care, you don't care in some sense what the parts are made of. And you, but learning more about the parts, ah, maybe you'd learn a little bit, but that's really not the level of analysis that you care about to understand chess, how to be a good chess player, how to be a good, how to win at chess. So if this is, and that's because this is a formal system where the only things that matter are the rules for manipulating the tokens. And if that's what we're like, then yeah, you could study brains. That's not a terrible thing to do, but it's not the level at which you're going to understand the mind. Yeah. Um, kind of regarding the formal system, is it at all immutable? Like, if, if I'm playing a game of chess and all the pawns disappear off the screen, the tokens that have those select rules are then gone. I don't have to consider them in the rest of the game. Of course. Don't have to worry about the of the remaining pieces. Does sure. That change the formal system? Well, it's the same formal system. It's the same formal system. So, I guess the... Does it, so, do the rules of chess change when you lose your rooks? The rules available to me, I guess, change. Yeah, but not the rules. The rules stay constant, right? So, the, the, I mean, the, rule, the rules that are relevant change over time, but the rules themselves are fixed. All right? Is that... Well, the specific game you're changing of playing, of course, changes. If, you, if your opponent takes all your pieces, the game you're playing, that, that instance of the game, is obviously different. But the game of chess remains constant. The rules of the game stay the same. Okay. Okay. So, back to this type token thing. So, the rules that apply to the token are the only things that determine what type it is. So if I am playing against you in chess and you're winning really hard and I get mad and I reach out and I snap your queen in two, you go, ha ha ha. And you very cleverly reach into your pocket and pull out a loony, put it on the table and say, that's my queen now, right? That works, that's, that's like, ah, I'm defeated, right? Because the only things that matter about what type of a token the thing is are which rules apply to it. So it's kind of arbitrary how, it's not, that, it's not that it doesn't matter at all. You can't play chess with alphabet soup, right? If you have a big bowl of alphabet soup and you say the O is your queen, that's not going to be a good game because it's not stable enough to instantiate the rules, right? But once you've got that much, once you've got tokens that can uh, meaningfully instantiate the rules, it doesn't matter after that what they're like. Compare this to non-formal games. Compare this to, uh, like, basketball. For That's just a game that popped into my head for no reason at all. Uh, so, <laughs> go Raps. Um, so in basketball, basketball is a non-formal game because the physical properties of the players matter a lot, right? You can't just substitute in one player for another without making a difference to the game, right? The physical properties of the ball, the physical properties of the net, all of those make a big difference to how the game unfolds. It's not just, well, he's like point guard, therefore anything that you substitute in for point guard would be identical, right? So non-formal systems are systems in which the physical properties of the tokens matter a lot above and beyond which rules apply to them. Formal games are which games in which that's not true. Yeah? So are we suggesting that like every human brain is the same? Or like, uh, like well, what, what, where are, what tokens would make up a human mind? Would that be symbols that you think about? Would it be neurons? Would it be like... So, yeah. 
Yeah, good. It's, a, it's a good question. So it could be the case that each mind instantiates a slightly different formal system. Okay. Uh, it could be the case that, uh, or it could be the case that they're all the same formal system and that we just have different tokens going in them. Um, one of the nice advantages of this way of thinking is that we can at least conceive of the idea that, for example, uh, other animals have mental tokens that are of the same type that we do. So maybe it's the case that when a dog smells a campfire, it's got mental tokens that are the same type as we do when we smell a campfire, but they're radically different, differently instantiated. So the dog's brain is different than our brain. It might be that the, it, the mental tokens that it uses to represent campfire smell are as different as chess pieces and people, but that they're the same type as that are in our brain. Uh, so you can imagine uh, like an octopus seems to have some level of intelligence and that an octopus brain is presumably quite different than ours, but maybe it's got the same types of tokens in it. Uh, you imagine building a robot. Robot would have radically different t like physical instantiations of these mental types or mental tokens, but they could be of the same type. Yeah? So one of the interesting consequences of this stuff, one of the interesting consequences of thinking about the mind as a formal system. Okay, let's talk about self-containedness. So here's a property of a formal game or a formal system uh, is that it's self-contained. That is to say, Nothing outside of the game is relevant to the unfolding of the game. You play chess in space, it's the same game, right? So, and furthermore, the meaning of the moves is irrelevant. This is kind of, I mean, it's fairly clear in chess. You can imagine playing chess with an elaborate backstory. You name all the pawns, you give them life histories, their movement through the board is like their attempt to overthrow an evil kingdom or something like that. It's kind of what we do when you play Monopoly, right? When you play Monopoly, what you're doing is not just abstractly manipulating tokens. Ah, the six-sided token has shown a thing with three divots, therefore I will manipulate my shoe shape token three squares to the right. No, you're like imagining yourself owning property, the millennial dream. Uh, you're, you're, you're indulging in the fantasy of being able to extract rent from property ownership. And that's part of the fun of the game. Technically, you don't have to do any of that, right? You could just play it on a purely meaningless level. Uh, but the, in, so in terms of the internal structure of the game, the way that the tokens are allowed to move, the legal moves in the game, the significance or the meaning of those tokens doesn't matter at all. So the playing with the shoe versus the top hat. A shoe is a different thing than a top hat, but because the same rules apply to both, there's no difference inside the game, right? So this is self-containedness in the sense that there's nothing outside of the position and type of the tokens that matters to which moves are legal. So it's a kind of closed world. And that gives us, all this together gives us medium independence. Got a little, a little ahead of ourselves, but uh, a formal game can be played in any sort of a medium, assuming that it's a medium sufficient to allow the rules to be like respected. Whereas a non-medium independent game like soccer or tennis, like tennis is a different game if you play it on clay than if you play it on grass, right? It's just a different game. The medium matters a lot. You can't, so you can, you can easily imagine being halfway through a chess game where you're moving physical pieces around. You're like, ah, oh, it's, it's getting late. I gotta go home. Let's try, let's pick this up again online. You just type in the positions of the pieces. And in some important sense, you're playing the same game. Right? There's, not a, there's not a deep discontinuity between the game that you started in one medium in the game that you finish in a different medium. Whereas if you're playing soccer and it like starts to rain, 
and then you say, okay, let's take this inside and finish this off on a foosball table. That's a different game, right? The medium matters quite a bit. So we get non-medium independence in a non-formal game. Again, think about how this plays out for AI. Yeah, yeah. Then you're not playing soccer That's right, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's the point is that the identity of the game, when you change medium, the ident it's a different game now. Well, that's a different, I mean, so if I say I'm really good at soccer, but what I mean is I'm really good at FIFA 19, I've kind of lied to you, right? Because those are just different games, right? My, my physical properties are profoundly ill-suited to playing actual soccer, whereas I may be, I haven't played FIFA 19, but I think I could get, I, like if I practiced, I could get okay with it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So getting back to like chess pieces, are we also saying that like things inside that game going on Um, so that's a standard assumption. I'm not sure that that's a necessary feature of formal systems. So you could imagine uh, a formal system that has rules that change over time. I think there's nothing contradictory about that. Well, you wouldn't need them, but they're still the rules. Oh, yeah. Isn't like the soccer the football analogy kind of like saying, okay, let's finish this game of chess by playing checkers? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, because it's, it, they're, they're deeply different games. Yeah, so does it say that soccer isn't a like formal game? Well, uh, so the FIFA is a much better example. So suppose you're halfway through an actual soccer game, starts raining, you say, let's go finish this off on FIFA. The rules are the same. I take it that the rules, I, I haven't played this game. The rules of soccer are all instantiated on the, in the game. So in some sense, the rules are the same. But aren't there types different? Well, it's, it's that it's a, yeah, well, it's a profound, well, the, no, the types are all the same. You still got defenders, you still got a ball, you still got goals, but that, it's just, it's not, the game is not independent of the medium in which you're playing the game. Sorry. Yeah, I saw uh, Trixie first. Yeah. Maybe a better way to say is like, okay, cool, we're going to World Cup's over right now. Let's just set out the Canadian team with the UT team. Right. <laughs> it's going to turn out different. Right, right, because they've got, you know, uh, they got defenders and they got forwards and they got midfields. Same types, same types, so just stick them in there. No, it matters a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. So, is it still, like, then everything else is the same except they're in the door, so is it still dependent on the medium? I think, so, I, th I think that's still a case of, it's a different, I mean, you'd still call it soccer, but they, they always say indoor, if it's indoor soccer, they always say indoor soccer because the, the ground is very different. They're not playing on grass anymore, they're playing on, like, parquet floors or something like that. So, the strategy has to be a little different. You're not gonna you're not gonna do as many slide tackles, or maybe you'll do more. Uh, so like, the fact that it changes the game, the internal dynamics of the game, because you've changed it from outdoor to indoor. Now, if you said something like, uh, you know, this this pitch isn't as good, so let's move over to that pitch. Maybe that's not a difference in medium. So it's still medium dependent, but you haven't changed the medium enough to matter, or something like that. It does change, the, you, you are changing the medium, but the rules and the internal dynamics of the game stay the same. So. But I can't tell if that is enough difference from like outdoor soccer to indoor soccer and then mm. chess on a board to like mental chess. Mm. Mm. What makes the features different enough that it's not medium dependent? So going from playing chess on a board to playing mental chess 
is a difference in the way that we're uh, interacting with the formal system. But I take it that the, the set of legal rules would be the same if you're holding the chessboard in your head when it's on the, as when it's on the table. Right? So it's about which, which moves are allowed within the game. And so if there's a difference in the allowed moves, the allowed manipulations of the symbols, then uh, that's, that's the cutoff, I would say. Something like that. But could there technically be a non-formal game that's not, that's not dependent on the medium? Um, yeah, yeah. So there can be, in non-formal games, there can be a relative medium independence. So it doesn't need to be the case that any non-formal game is, un, is completely dependent on the medium. So your example of indoor to outdoor soccer is probably a good one where, like, it's a minor, it might, you might call it a minor change in medium, but it's a still the same game. The, the only thing is that if it's a formal game, then it's got pure medium independence. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I mean, some people still consider it the same game. Sure. But then other people would say no, it's totally different. Yeah. So is it context dependent? What's the threshold? Um, where do you set that up? So in a non-formal system like this, it's probably context dependent. Uh, so trying to decide when it's the same game or not in a non-formal system is actually kind of hard. So what we're what we're digging around in here is Look, in a non-formal system, when is it the same game? When is it not? That's a difficult question. It probably matters about what you care about. So like, you know, is this is a big enough difference to make it a different game or not? That's a, just a whole big set of messy questions that usually comes down to what makes a difference in the game. If it's a formal game, there's no ambiguity here. It's the same game so long as the same rules apply. So that's one of the differences is it's hard to say when it's the same game in a non-formal game, but when it's a formal game, it's actually pretty straightforward. Good. Yeah. Getting back to the question of sameness and differentness of a game. Yeah. If I have a, a fixed formal system of rules that don't modify themselves, and I have another formal system of rules that do modify themselves, if the self-modifying system replicates the rules of the first system, what is the distinction between the two? Uh, a game that basically well, that's. Any other game. I think that you've described an impossibility because if one system is not self-modifying and the other is, then they can't be the same system. Can you make yourself not self-modifying? Uh, maybe, but then it's not self-modifying anymore. Would it be different than the other game though? It must be. <laughs> yes. But you know, they're both not self-modifying. They both have the same rules. Though. Well, one has a set of rules that are not changing over time. So it's got a bunch of rules that are different that aren't changing, but they still got a bunch of rules. So if I use my changing rules over time to reach a point in which my rules can no longer change over time, I say, okay, that's it, I'm stopping at these set of rules, and my set of rules are identical to the fixed system, what is the distinction between the two? Well, one has a bunch of rules that the other doesn't. It's just that they're not changing. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Uh, let me do one last thing and I'll give you a break. Let me show you medium independent formal systems, the too much free time edition. So here is an, a dramatic example of medium independence. And once again, we're going to YouTube to observe a, oh no. So this is, I can't put it full screen or else it will uh, be cut off on the video. This is a computer built in Minecraft. Somebody with just unimaginable amounts of skill and dedication and so much free time <laughs> uh, built a computer. So this is them typing on an enormous keyboard. <laughs> and it's coming up slowly, slowly, but the letters are coming up on a screen. <laughs> so, I think they're just going to go with hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that? The channel. Oh, you know this person? I don't know. I don't know who. The, I don't know who this is. Uh, yes, we'll determine that on the break. Okay, so. 
medium independence says that you can instantiate the system in any system, in kind of any suitable medium. Here, this person has built a formal, like it's a computer, it can do math. It doesn't just type out words. You can, you can enter in like uh, six times eight and it will tell you the answer. I've heard, I haven't, I'm not gonna show you the video, but somebody built a, gen, a GPU uh, in Minecraft with like 4K of memory or something like that. Uh, you could theoretically build a computer in Minecraft on which you could play Minecraft. Uh, if you had a large enough memory and were incredibly patient. Now, uh, some things to point out here is that uh, formal equivalent, so this is formally equivalent to a, a computer. Formal equivalence does, none, does not in any sense guarantee practical equivalence. So you wouldn't want to type out your essay on this thing, right? Because it's incredibly inconvenient and slow, it's clunky, it's practically different in a huge number of ways from a computer that you're used to, right? So formal equivalence does not mean practical or engineering equivalence in any way. So what we've been talking adds up to this concept of formal equivalence. Uh, so two systems are formally equivalent when there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the, to the tokens of one system to the tokens of the other. Any move that's legal in one is legal in the other, and the starting positions and configurations are the same. So if any two systems, formal systems, meet those two criteria, they're formally equivalent, and in some sense, they're the same. Well, they're not the same tokens of formal systems, they're the same type of formal systems. Uh, <clears throat> another way of talking about this, so we're really kind of doing the same thing in different language several times. So if it's like, hey, isn't this the same as the other thing? Yeah, it's basically the same as the other thing. Uh, another way of talking about this and the way that philosophers like to talk about this is in terms of multiple realizability. So if your system is medium independent and there are several formally equivalent ways of instantiating it, then it is multiply realizable. So uh, this is the kind of diagram philosophers will show you when they're talking about multiple realizability. Let's say M1 is a mental state and M2 is a different mental state. So you go from one mental state to another. Say I've just stubbed my toe and I go from the mental state of not being in pain to the mental state of being in pain. Uh, that's instantiated, presumably, let's say in me, that's P1, physical state one, that's instantiated in some nerves firing in my toe, going up to my brain and telling me that I've hurt my toe, right? So that's P1 is me blissfully not having toe pain, and then P4 is me having toe pain, okay? Now, if my mind is a formal system that is multiply realizable, then there are lots of other ways to go from this, to do this transition from not being in pain to being in pain. So let's say P2 is a robot not having toe pain. Suppose it's got toes that could feel pain. And then P5 is that robot having banged its toe and having toe pain, right? So radically different physical change. For me, it's neurons firing. For the robot, it's presumably transistors flipping or whatever. Uh, so the, the physical instantiation of that change is very, very different, but it's multiply realizable. It could be realized in multiple different ways. And that's a rather important property, multiple realizability is a rather important property if we're going to have any hope of coming up with AI. So let's, let's, get, one, let's get this clear. Formal systems are not the only way to get multiple realizability. There are other things that are, there are informal things that are multiply realizable. But if you want AI, you need multiple realizability. Why is that? Why should that be the case? Yeah. Something beside a brain? Right, right. So yeah, if we're gonna build genuinely artificial intelligence, so here's a way to build non-artificial intelligence. Have a baby. That's one way of making an intelligence, standard way, that's how I got here. Uh, but if you're going to make non-regular, non-standard intelligence, 
you could you need to do it in a different presumably we're thinking of it as a different medium right you're going to build a robot it's going to be made of silicon or something like that and that the assumption the belief that we can build something genuinely intelligent intelligent in the way that we're intelligent conscious in the way that we're conscious uh, maybe not identically conscious like it might it might differ in the details but if we're going to have something that's genuinely intelligent that's artificial it has to be intelligence has to be multiply realizable yeah yes it does so your your first thing got to the point exactly um, so you might you might be a person who thinks that intelligence is not multiply realizable in the sense that it needs a brain to exist and that if you build a robot that acts intelligently it's not really intelligent that would be what you'd believe. If you believe that intelligence is not multiply realizable, then you would have to deny, no matter how smart the robot is acting, you'd have to deny that it's really intelligent. Because somehow, intelligence is deeply, deeply linked to having a head full of tapioca, like having a, having a brain, right? Uh, yeah? So multiple realizability for this is just, you can construct it and get to, their, get to that point in multiple that's right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's that many different media could have the same type of thing going on. Uh, now, formal, uh, the belief that the mind is a formal system is a really attractive way of getting multiple realizability to just fall out. So the stuff that I've just been telling you is all trying to show you how if the mind is a formal system, then it's very clearly going to be multiply realizable in the same way that chess is multiply realizable in the same way that any formal system is multiply realizable, right? So if you believe that the mind is a formal system with all the properties of formal systems we've been talking about, multiple realizability just kind of falls out as a nice bonus, right? So the hope of AI is very much alive. Now, you don't necessarily need to be a formal system to be multiply realizable. So think, for example, of... Uh, Convection. Actually, think, scratch that. That's, that's too complicated to explain. Think about synchrony. Synchrony. The, the, remember the metronomes I showed you? They started off all disordered, all out of sync, and then they slowly came into sync. That's a phenomenon that's multiply realizable. That can happen in all kinds of different media. So the same basic dynamics that underwrite those metronomes coming into sync, you can use, the, you can use models that describe that which also describe things like the cells in your heart staying in sync. And also describe things like fireflies. There's certain species of fireflies that uh, blink in synchrony. So you can see like a whole river bank of fireflies all flashing at the same time. And it's the same basic mechanism, fireflies, heart cells, met metronomes. The synchrony, the synchronization works the same in all. So it's a multiply realizable phenomena but it's not a formal system. None of those are formal systems. They're dynamic systems, right? So you can have multiple realizability in non-formal systems, in dynamical systems. It's harder, to, it's harder to see how that's gonna work, right? It's not as guaranteed. It's not as neatly and cleanly as guaranteed as with formal systems, but it's nonetheless still possible. So this is one of the reasons why people were so attracted to this view of the mind, the idea that it's a formal system, is because it kind of guarantees this multiple realizability. And without multiple realizability, your hopes for AI are just done, right? You have to have multiple realizability to get AI. And formal systems seem to show us the way. So for a long time, this was the dominant view. Uh, and here was the hope. So here's the metaphor in the good old fashioned AI paradigm. Psychology describes the software of the mind. Neuroscience describes the hardware. CogSci puts them together. This was, this was the great hope. Um, so 
you can see why this would be attractive, especially to psychologists. Because that means you don't have to go messing around with all this studying the brain stuff. You can do psychology without worrying too much about the brain. And in the 60s, when we had very poor access to what was going on in the brain, that was a really attractive proposition. So you don't, I mean, I take it that you're trying to learn Excel. I suppose you're trying to learn Excel. Are you worried about the computer chips? Probably not, right? You don't need to worry about the hardware implementation to learn about the software. Similarly, the hope was that there was a nice clean hardware software distinction in our minds, which, allow, which would allow us to uh, just study the mind without worrying too much about the brain. Yeah. Well, you can represent the, the hardware limitations at the software level. So, but is that then hardware driving software development? Like of course, of course. I mean, so the hardware is clearly not irrelevant in principle to how the software is acting, right? And you can, you, you can only run Microsoft Office if you've got enough RAM, you've got the right kind of computer. You can't run it on Minecraft. But that's not to say that learning about Microsoft Office requires, in any way, learning about the hardware. Maybe at the edges, maybe a little, but fundamentally the study of the software should operate at the software level. That's some, your main place where you're gonna learn stuff. Yeah? But I mean, aren't, aren't, don't the two kind of like, go off of each other? I mean, you can imagine that they even in like the, the human brain, like the software, like your psychology mm -hmm. does affect how your brain like, just functions. Ah. Likewise, ah. your brain does That's. Like, how it is. Yes. It affects how the like, how mind functions. Uh, it's, so. And to understand it a deep, like if you want to, to, to apply kind of like the scientific model, to really understand how like Excel works, mm -hmm. to understand everything about it, you do have to understand the hardware and vice versa to really understand the limits of hardware you have to understand the software that So, okay, so the first thing you said was, was okay, there's at least two things there. Let me, let me do the first thing first and then the second thing second. So, doesn't the, the way your mind operates change your brain? And that does seem to be the case. And what we'll see in, uh, when we shift from the good old fashioned AI view to connectionism is a model that has that built right in. So, in a connectionist network, there is no distinction between hardware and software. The two are just deeply interlinked. There's no distinction between processing and memory. The two are just deeply interlinked. So in a connectionist network, this clean hardware-software distinction deeply breaks down. And you can't talk about one without the other. Now, uh, that's something that these people wanted to reject. The good old fashioned AI people wanted to reject. They wanted a nice, clean hardware software distinction. And then we just asked serious questions about whether that's pl a plausible view about how we work. And I think that there's tons of evidence that that's not a plausible view of how we work, that we are more like a connectionist network than a computer. We are more like, like the way that you use your brain affects the structure of your brain. Uh, seems to be a really, a very clear, sort of like result of, once we started getting good brain scans, good brain scanners, you could watch the brain in action, it became fairly clear that the things that you do affect the structure of the brain. But that was kind of like in the 50s and the 60s and the, into the 70s, that was pretty cutting edge stuff. So we hadn't yet got to the point where we could make those claims with any confidence. So, uh, yeah. On the second thing, like don't you really need to understand the hardware to understand Microsoft Excel? Uh, I would put it to you that you can run Excel on vastly different hardware. So in some sense, having a completely complete understanding does involve understanding the hardware. 
so if you want to know absolutely everything about Excel, yeah, that's that's true. You do need you should know something about the hardware, but that's kind of because it could be run on a whole bunch of different hardwares. That's sort of just say gilding the lily. That's sort of like going beyond probably what you really need to know to understand the thing. Um, now I don't want to. I shouldn't put this too strongly though. This is it's it's true that. Uh, psychologists had more than zero interest in brains at this period. It wasn't there like, well, that's completely uninteresting to us. We don't want to know anything about it uh, because they did do some brain stuff. But unfortunately, what they were limited to was stuff like looking what happened, looking at what happens when you have a traumatic brain injury. So like Phineas Gage, who got the the pull through his head. So you look at something like that and say, ah, this must be the visual center because when the when the person had a stroke and that part of the brain was ruined. That's what, that's the faculty that they lost. So they had some interest, um, but it was a, it's a kind of, it's a quite limited interest uh, in the same way that if what your goal is really to understand the software that you're interacting with, probably you're gonna have a very limited interest in the hardware. Yeah. Uh -huh. To understand, to use that software while using it, I have to understand that like, the hardware is fine, and if I keep opening up these tabs, the machine yeah. is not working yeah. or it's not going to work properly. Right? Yeah, I think I just addressed that. It, it, it's either a two way stream where software is also guiding hardware, but hardware is also guiding software. Like, yeah, yeah I, I, think I, I think I addressed that just a moment ago. Does that? It, it's this, so they're, they're clearly just saying that. Psychology is separate, hardware is separate, and it could be this model. Well, that the main business of psychology is not to be interested in brains. Okay. I mean, and Cogsci did want to put these things together. It's not, not like it was irrelevant, but. Um, okay. So. Brace yourself, I'm gonna put the word, the M word on the, on the screen, metaphysics. Uh, metaphysics is not as weird as it sounds. It just means your picture of what's in the world. Philosophers keep trying to quit doing metaphysics. It's like a bad relationship that you can't get out of. Like, you know, I thought I left her and then she texted me and I just had to, like we keep getting sucked back into metaphysics. But it just, it really just means like a picture of what's in the world. So if this picture that I'm presenting to you is right, that there's a crisp hardware software distinction, then let, let me not say that the brain is irrelevant to learning about the mind. It's not irrelevant, it's relevant. In the same way that you could learn about a piece of software by, by looking at what's going on in the chips, right? You can, you can do that, that's not irrelevant. Uh, but it means that in principle, psychology is never reducible to neuroscience, right? You can never get rid of the psychological level because there's something like the, the, your hardware could run many different softwares, your softwares could be running on many different hardwares, they're in principle different studies. And they can inform each other, but one can never collapse into the other. Psychology will never collapse into neuroscience. Uh, it gives us a nice way, it also gives us a nice way of thinking about the relationship between minds and brains. So your mind is not just brain activity in the sense that explaining the mind is not just explaining how brains act because your mind could have happened on a different hardware. Your mind could have been on a computer, your mind could have been in a very different brain. So understanding the mind means not just understanding the brain. It's not reducible to understanding brains at brain activity. But it's also not like these guys are saying that you've got a ghost in you, right? It's not, it's not a spiritual thing in the same way that software, Excel is not a ghost in your computer. It's just computer stuff, right? Everything that the software does is ultimately grounded in hardware. It's the activity of hardware, but it's nonetheless 
not completely explainable. You don't want your explanation of Excel to be framed in hardware terms because it's multiply realizable. So there's nothing immaterial, but it's also the science of minds doesn't just collapse into the science of brains. Yeah? Like getting back to synoptic integration and kind of building a framework between the sub-disciplines, wouldn't that goal of being producing some kind of common lexicon where a psychologist can speak to a neuroscientist imply that there is a link between the two, that yeah. there is a transition? Yeah. Like, but that wasn't the goal that these guys had set themselves. That was something that I said to you, not something that came out of the 1960s. Like, I, I guess just this issue here is like, if, if we're trying to communicate from one thing to the other, can, can you just redefine another with whatever the language is that you have? Like, if we do have a lexicon, you know, like, yeah, I can use a bunch of Greek to then describe a bunch of Latin or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that not what we are kind of doing with integration? Uh, no, with synoptic integration, the idea would be that all of these disciplines transform each other. That we would generate a new paradigm that's different from any of the original paradigms. But, but, back to, like, if a neuroscientist is trying to describe their behavior and they, you know, they communicate with a psychologist and say, okay, I guess the, you know, the, our findings in neuroscience can be mapped to this kind of behavior of psychology, can neuroscience no, no, no. In the same way that you, I mean, you can speak the language, you could speak about the mind in the language of neuroscience. In the same way that you could talk about what's going on in Excel just in terms of what's moving, what's happening in your hardware. But that's not the best language in which to describe Excel because Excel is multiply realizable. Yeah, yeah, you could have many different hardwares. That's what I mean by the multiply realized. You could have many different hardwares, you could have many different types of software running on the same hardware. Okay. So, for a long time, uh, this was, and I quote, the only game in town. Jerry Fodor was, you probably, has anybody here heard of Jerry Fodor? Okay, he's one of the most famous guys in cognitive science. He's one of the kind of like big names. Uh, now you've heard of him, hooray. Uh, and he was one of the most prominent defenders of the good old fashioned view of AI. And he thought that good old fashioned AI was the only way that you could have a science of cognitive science. And this was plausible for like decades, very much decades. Uh, less plausible now. He died a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Anyway. That's not why it's less plausible, but it's, anyway, so quickly. Things that this does not entail. Uh, well, if your mind is a formal system being run on your brain, when your brain goes away, your mind goes away. Unless you are Ray Kurzweil, who believes that we can upload our minds onto a computer. He thinks that he looked at the curve of how many transistors fit on a chip. It's been doubling every 18 months for like 50 years. And he just extrapolates that forwards like 20 years, 30 years, and it eventually gets to a point where it's so much that you've got like infinite computational power. He calls it the technological singularity. We will all be, all of our brains will be scanned and uploaded to the cloud and it will be the nerd rapture. We will all go to heaven and live forever in the cloud. It's gonna be great. Um, yeah. Doesn't Moore's law break down like a decade? Like, are we literally hitting that those limits right now? Like, you can't extrapolate that further? I, I don't believe we're gonna continue to go forever. So I agree, uh, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course. Just quickly, I want to point out that a whole lot of science fiction assumes, I think, something like a formal systems theory of the mind. So has anybody seen Altered Carbon? So in Altered Carbon, you can beam, you, you can beam your mind into somebody else's body, right? It's just, an, it's just a series of ones and zeros that once you're downloaded into their brain, it's like, oh, I'm in a different body now. And I really think that that assumes that the mind is something like software that is hardware independent. So that your mind and your body are not profoundly integrated with each other. That's kind of the assumption behind this. Yeah? Did you guys ever think about kind of with regard to Turing University, 
the machine of <laughs> software is hardware independent, can you use software to represent hardware? Like Troy set up this universal machine to represent any kind of software. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like with that set of like beaming yourself into another brain or something like that, are, you're not just using that brain to emulate whatever was different from the previous brain. That's what I'm saying, that they're assuming that it's something like this is true. Okay, I know that I'm straining your attention span, so I'm gonna whip through the last of this. Uh, here's another thing that it doesn't, that it doesn't entail. Uh, I don't know if any of you are tempted by this, but it doesn't entail that emotions can't be captured scientifically. So just because, so on the formal systems account, you can still have feelings that are part of your mind. Uh, what I'm saying, what these guys are saying is that your mind is in some sense made of logic, but that's not to entail that everything that you do is logical. So computers, computer programs are in some sense, in some loose sense, made of logic. But you can program a computer to like sing a funny song or do something silly, right? Right? You can, you can, pro, you can use logic to build something that doesn't act in a purely like logical sense. So none of this entails that there's nothing like feeling or emotion in the mind. It's just that those feelings and emotions sometimes somehow have to boil down to logical operations. Uh, here's something important that it seems to leave out, which is development, the development of the mind. So when you're thinking about formal systems, and okay, so this is more of a historical claim than a claim about what's true in principle. These guys did not think about how you go from being a baby to being an adult. They were very much just interested in the adult mind. Um, and that, that's something that changes over time. I mean, so, changes over time, huh? So, uh, as we go out of the GoFi era, start thinking about the mind as a dynamical system, it becomes more and more prevalent that people start thinking about cognitive development rather than just cognitive structures. So, just as a historical fact, the good old fashioned AI research program tried to think about just like full blown intelligence and not how you get to intelligence. Whereas the dynamical, thinking about the mind as a dynamical system, they think about cognition basically as how do you change over time? And that's kind of the basics of their theories are how do you update yourself as, you're, as you grow and develop? So this is something that changed in emphasis. And it also seems to leave out the relevance of neuroscience, as I think I, we, we just discussed this. So like, hopefully you all, I mean, many of you are pushing back and say, but, but the brain does matter. And I think that's exactly right. The brain does matter to understanding the mind. It's our best example of a mind. Uh, and our minds do end up being like, I mean, I, I think even more than the brain, uh, third generation cog size starts thinking about how the mind is integrated with the body. Like it's not just a brain thing. Your whole body and your body as an embedded in an environment, embedded in a society, is what your brain, what your mind is made up of, right? So they tend to think of the good old fashioned AI perspective tends to think of the mind as completely abstracted from the way that we are embedded in and embodied in the world. And contemporary cog sci actually starts thinking seriously about that stuff like the way that we're involved in complex causal loops with our environment. Just one really quick example, when people are playing Tetris, it's actually faster to press the button and have the piece rotate on the screen than it is to mentally rotate it. So you can use this complex causal connection you have to the world as part of your cognition. The world is in some sense helping you think. And that's just not something that happens in this view, right? So the way in which your mind is realized in a brain, the way in which your brain is connected to your body, the way your, which your body is connected to the world and to a larger social world, all of that gets kind of ignored for the, for the pre in preference for thinking about abstract formal structures that are just kind of static in your mind. So, this is part of where we're gonna go, where it's gonna develop from here. Okay, we've gone longer than usual. That's it for today.
Next time we'll do automaticity and interpretation, but next time is quite a while away, right? We've got like two weeks of break. I believe so. Yeah, uh, so the next two weeks are break. I will be here regular class time on Tuesday with your tests. You can come pick up your tests. You can talk to me about your essays. We can discuss your tests. I'll be here. So you don't have to be here, but I'll be.